Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Reflection Podcast. My name is Bill H. Manipulated people to get what I wanted. I, I spent hours and hours and days and days trying to get what I wanted. The hardest part of my recovery was learning to uh, get over the shame of what I had been doing in my life, learning how to really love who I was. And that's what humanness is all about, right? At least to me, it's doing the best you can, hoping for the best and realizing that as long as I'm honest about it and try and my best effort, that it's okay, it's okay. If I get connected in the morning with my spiritual self and my higher power, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day, no matter what happens. Welcome to the Daily Reflection Podcast with your hosts, Michael L. and Lee M. On this show, we try to provide inspiration through interviews with members of the recovery community. We are not affiliated with any 12-step or recovery programs, but you will hear them mentioned throughout the course of an interview. On today's show, Bill H. sharing on the concept of accepting our humanness. Before we get to the show, I'd like to ask a favor. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, could you give us a rating? Let us know what you think of the show. It's going to help us improve and expand our reach. We hope you enjoy this show. Good morning, Lee. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. How are you this morning, Mike? I'm fantastic. What's going on for today? So today is April 3rd, and we have with us um, Bill H. from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, here to share with us on the reflection for today. I think it's his birthday today as well, if I'm not mistaken. So happy birthday, Bill. And he's here to share with us on the reflection for today, which is accepting our humanness. Well, fantastic. Bill, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on the podcast. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for having me. So we start the show out in the same way every day. We ask the guests to read The Daily Reflection. Would you get us started? Sure. So April 3rd, Daily Reflection. Accepting our humanness, we finally saw that the inventory should be ours, not the other man's. So we admitted our wrongs honestly and became willing to set these matters straight. As Bill sees it, page 222. Why is it that the alcoholic is so unwilling to accept responsibility? I used to drink because of the things that the other people did to me. Once I became to AA, I was told to look at where I had been wrong. What did I have to do with all these different matters? When I simply accepted that I had a part in them, I was able to put it on the paper and see it for what it was, humanness. I am not expected to be perfect. I have made errors before and I will make them again. To be honest about them allows me to accept them and myself and those with whom I had the differences. From there, recovery is just a short distance ahead. Well, so kicking us off into inventory right off the bat on this one. Um, What's your sobriety date, Bill? My sobriety date is February 1st, 2017. So what was it like for you as you came in to AA Bill as a new, you know, somebody new into recovery, you know, that, that created in you the willingness to even think about getting into these steps? I um, came into AA thinking I just had a problem with alcohol. I, I didn't actually commit to the program right away. I mean, I, I stopped drinking on the advice of a physician. I really thought my problem was another behavior pattern I had that was causing all my trouble. Over the couple months that I uh, was in the rehab, working on myself a little bit, I came to realize that uh, if I didn't really become honest about the alcohol problem, I was going to have a big problem down the road. And I started to commit to that as a uh, substantial problem that I had. It took a lot of honest listening to hearing the similarities between what I had going on with me in my life and the stories that I was hearing in the meetings that I was going to during the time I was kind of contemplating my entrance into the program. I um, began to realize that if I didn't, it was really for me at beginning coming totally honest about what was what I was all about. And I, I had this, I don't know what it was. I think it was just a, maybe a God moment in a sense. I had this intuition that I needed to commit to the alcohol program because if I didn't, 
I just had this, I don't know what it was. I had this knowledge that if I didn't, I was going to have a problem. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, of course, because I have, I made a commitment and I started, you know, my life was unmanageable, right? That was no question at the time I came in. I wasn't hundred, as I said, I 100% convinced I was powerless over alcohol. I, I, it, I just, I still had that doubt in my head. I was in a bad space at the time I came in to the recovery program systems. Uh, but I wasn't hundred percent convinced that I was powerless. And, and um, you know, that was my will, right? That was my will still. I take it back once in a while. And that's part of the, the process really. But I did you know, very quickly realize that I needed help and I needed to help help that was bigger than me, power greater than myself. However you want to define it, I chose to ultimately call that God. And then that um, third step was a um, making a decision, right? It wasn't, there was a bit of faith there because I didn't really know what was ahead. I was a little bit scared because I knew I had to kind of start looking at myself, but made a decision, right? To give, try to give my will up. But I did know, and then in retrospect, it's much more clear because as I go through, the, went through the steps in the program and spent some time thinking about things and being very clear uh, that it was all about me, the bondage of self. That's really what the problem was. I was all roiled up in myself. I had, um, I just was, you know, I came in when I was over 60. So I, I had a lot of years of doing pretty well, but I, I, looking back, it was all fighting. I was always fighting to get what I wanted. Nowadays, I spend so much less energy on it. This is quite nice. And that kind of was, I mean, this reflection today is, was really a foundation for me to work my way through recovery because I was, to be honest with you, quite hard on myself. I um, survived by trying to be somebody else and accepting my humanness. Uh, that was, I wanted it. I, I wanted myself and everybody else around it to be perfect. I wanted to control things. I wanted to, um, you know, I'm no dummy. And I, I, I manipulated people to get what I wanted. I, I spent hours and hours and days and days trying to get what I wanted all of that energy. I didn't realize it at the time, but I now realize it's all this energy trying to control and manipulate and get what I want at work and get what I want out of people I was training, get what I wanted out of my family situation, get what I wanted. You know, what I wanted there was something that was missing inside me. Um, and that was my willingness to accept that I was a human person and that I could be something less than perfect. Both my parents went to college actually, and they wanted me to work hard and do well. And they put a lot of demands on me. At least I felt that way anyway. And I have since, my parents have both died, but I've since kind of um, made up with them. I don't, you know, they were human too. And I, and, you know, they did the best they can. I, I'm doing the same. I have done the same with my kids. And I'm doing the same with myself, doing the best I can. And that's what humanness is all about, right? At least to me, is doing the best you can. And expecting, well, hoping for the best and realizing that, yeah, that's whatever I can do is as long as I'm honest about it and try and give my best effort that it's okay. It's okay. That way, I still get a lot of things I want. You know, I, it's, um, I, it's not like I'm accepting something that's less than um, what I feel is what I need. I mean, I have um, the topic here when you read through it is a lot of opportunities right uh, humanness being perfect be honest acceptance acceptance of other people i mean all, all sorts of great topics here i um think for me it was the hardest part of my recovery was learning to uh, get over the shame of what i had been doing in my life learning how to really love who i was First, I had to figure out who I was, right? That's what the fourth step is all about. At least in my mind, figure out who I am, right? And um, the way I t went through with my sponsor was not only to look at, yeah, the, you know, honestly, the easy stuff is the heart, is the bad stuff, right? Because that's why I beat myself up with all the time. I judge, I'm intolerant, I get angry, 
I uh, do things to other people that hurt them. Um, I say bad things to my kids sometimes. Um, it's so easy to identify those things because every time I do that, I there's shame that is there. It, it's it's there. It's not you can deny it, but it it's there. It, it kind of c- covers your heart a little bit and, and uh, kind of makes it hard to get to show who you really are. It, that shame. And so that was okay. That's I did all, I did that. But the other side, you know, there's some good things. You know, I I was a good parent. I can be kind. I can be caring. I have that in me. So looking at the good is, as well as the negative characteristics that I have was helpful because that's kind of as I went through four, five, six, and seven came to me. They said, "Yeah, see, like I'm like everybody else." I'm not different now. I'm not special. I'm not, I'm just some guy has these same issues as when I hear the stories that people talk about and, you know, there's identify with everybody. There's always something, you know, in some story that I can say, man, I totally identify with that. And that's another thing that connection that I get there when I identify with somebody. I don't think I was isolating. I was hiding myself. I wouldn't hide myself in the room, right? I would, I would be amongst my family, but I would be, I would be by myself. My wife tells the story of me, like she, and this was like towards, and I was just really feeling being bad. But she would come in, sit next to me on the couch, and I would like five minutes, or I'd leave to go to another room. It's the craziest behavior. And then she would come and chase me there, and I go to another room. It was the craziest stuff. I was so. And I'm looking back, it was I was so uncomfortable being there and being in my family situation. I I just had to move. I, I was crazy. I don't know. Uh, it was there was um, you know I I hear people talk when I uh, some of these men and women with the long term sobriety and they hear how they talk and they, and you say and they tell the stories of what they had in the past and how they behave. And I, I, I look at them and hear them, I hear their voice and hear their calmness and hear their, their sort of uh, serenity, right? I say, how the, I can't believe they were like that. I can't believe them because they sound so much different. I can't, I just can't even imagine that they did any of that stuff. I'm hoping that's where I'm going to be someday. I'm getting there. I really, uh, uh, that's where the acceptance. And I had a talk with my sponsor the other day and we're talking about patience that kind of ties into this acceptance is because patience for me is uh, stepping back and let God's will take over accepting that if I just back away and let be a good person right and do my recovery and then let God's will work for me uh, and, and it's I you know I can't identify any particulars of what he told me to do that day but the point is if I step back and let my let things happen and be patient i first of all at that time i now become calm and my mind settles down and i can actually pay attention to the day and be be present right but then things happen for me my life is um well i could say right now so i'm living separated from my wife right for four years now and my marriage is better now than it ever was during the time we were living together. If you, I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but because I'm such, I have a, such a different attitude about how I approach my life. And that's all comes from learning how to love myself, realizing I'm a human being, not expecting per- perfection, maybe hoping to be pretty good, but not expecting it. Being honest about when I, when I honest about, who I am and honest about times I need to go back and do some work and accepting that, okay, this is the way it is right now. And if I just keep doing this, it's going to get better. And every time I do that, it gets better. And it's like, it's a self-fulfilling thing. And it just, it's like a powerful, just pulls me along. I don't have to push it. It pulls me along. Talk a little bit about your conception of a higher power. What does that look like for Mm -hmm. you? It's a, on page 85, it says, what we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. That is like the key those hit me every day. And I actually find that that's what makes it work for me. I go through a variety of different experiences of myself every day. And sometimes I, I call it, I'm in my spiritual spot. So I'm being kind and caring and, and humble and patient and tolerant. And, 
you know, I, I'm, I'm happy when I'm there. It takes a little bit of work. And then there are times where I'm at, when I, in my more worldly self of that, uh, the, having a few of those negative things where most of it's related to pride for me, fear, anger, resentment, judgment, big one for me too, judgment. I'm all over the board in that, that area. So I can flip back and forth in an hour. I find that um, if I make a specific effort to connect, and that's why that's where my higher power is, is connection. And I can't, I have, a, I have a sort of a morning routine that I use. I have a, a sort of a, a short and extended version depending on how much time I have every day, but I um, connect with my higher power and my spirituality so that I can have a good day. And if I don't connect every morning in some fashion, it doesn't take much now. I can do a simple prayer. I can read a simple reading. The daily reflection could be one thing. There's a, there's a variety of ways I can connect. Like this reading today is a, would be a total, it would be a positive connection for me to read about this today. Cause I, it talks about, you know, we are imperfect and that's okay. Um, and so when I, get connected and let go i am now what happens then is i can be present i can be present for people in my day and when i go to work on monday and tuesdays it's really early so i have to do kind of a short version but if i do this spend the time 20 minutes i go to work and i everybody's so much nicer i don't know what it is it's me i know it's me but the point is that um I have just a, such a better way of dealing with, with the world when I am okay with myself as being not perfect. Because I don't then, it, what, what, usually what happens with perfection for me is I hold other people to my standards and then get mad at them for doing what I don't, I want them to do. And, and it's, it's a, just a horrible behavior. Um, but I'm good at it, unfortunately. Um, I, I don't have that when I get connected and it has to be some higher power. Cause I am, I spent a lot of years practicing the other way and I am able to do this relatively easily now within a short period of time. Like four years for me is like it, I don't consider that a long time. And, I, and, I, and sometimes um, I hesitate to give these small talks because I, I just don't have my, I still don't feel I have my thoughts all together. So sometimes I feel like I ramble a little bit too much. Um, but I know for sure that I, if I am, if I get connected this in the morning with my spiritual self and my higher power, there is, it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a good day, no matter what happens. I feel the same way. And I like what you said about sometimes you feel anxious about doing the talks because you don't have your thoughts all together. And um, I think sometimes, I mean, I feel like that all the time and I've, I've got a couple of years, but I wonder about moments of growth. Like as we go through these moments where we are learning about ourselves and we are uncovering these things and seeing that they don't work. I think sometimes it is hard to put that into some kind of clear, concise, you know, essay because we haven't quite figured it out. And I'm wondering, um, what's your process as you uncover these defects of character or whatever I, you know, we kind of have started calling them character defaults or character traits that no longer serve us. But in the book, it says, it says character defects. So as you dis discover these things, what is the, can you walk us through how this works for you? I'll, I'll give you an example. I think it's sometime I'm starting to learn that sometimes it's best to give a story to explain it, rather than trying to intellectualize it because I'm good at kind of intellectualizing stuff and it's kind of why I avoid answers sometimes but my wife and I are in the process of working it back out and we went together with the kids to a little ski place nearby Philadelphia called Spring Mountain for those that live in Philadelphia and it's a little tiny place where you take your kids and teach them how to ski and I found myself behaving in a way that I was well I was being impatient I was being angry with not getting what I want, but wanted things to work this way. And I decided this was what we're going to do when it didn't work out. And then there was, we were having the kids taught by an instructor and he brought the kids back early. And I was, we were angry about, you know, I was, I got home and that day I, I was sort of sitting there thinking about myself and my behavior. And I said, Oh my God, you were the, you were a 
that was a bad day. And you were just, I don't, I didn't like myself. I thought that I didn't like who I was today. And I think all my character defects were on display, right? The whole, I'm just one after the other. It was a, you know, I don't want to beat myself up. But I thought it was a pretty pitiful display to be honest with you. But the point is that um, that's something before recovery, I would have just totally blown away is that's everybody else's fault. Why, you know, they don't understand if they just done what I wanted them to do, everything would have been so much better for me anyway. Um, now I just say, I judge my, I look at myself and say, and that, this is, I guess, a 10 step, right? But look at myself and say, wow, that you need to, you need to do, go back and think about that. And so I talked about it at a meeting. I talked about it with my sponsor and I know what the problem was. I was, I was just, I needed to go back and admit that, yeah, I needed to continue to work on these things. It wasn't like I had to go and, yeah, I, I made him, I apologized to my wife for some of my behavior and, and you know, I did a few things, but it wasn't like I was being terrible at, but I could, it, I just, I could feel inside me, which is what the program puts in me is a feeling inside me that I'm behaving in pro I'm not behaving like I need to behave. And that I need to look, there's something about, why I'm doing this that's wrong with me and I need to look at it. And I was just being basically, I wasn't being kind and caring and compassionate and, and patient. I was just being the total opposite. That's why I keep asking to have my character defects removed because I need, they still hang in there. They hang in there. It's not a process where um, one and done for me, at least then work. So I'm thinking about shame versus guilt. Guilt is about what you've done and shame is about who you are. And um, I love the book where it says, you know, our, our past, our, our experiences become our greatest treasures, that there's intrinsic value in some of the things that we've done, even the really horrible things that we've done. So I'm curious, have you found that space yet where you're finding value in the really troublesome parts of your past? Uh, what I've come to realize is when I'm acting against my values is when I get shame. And, and if, you, if I continually act against my values, uh, it is to spiral downwards. Um, yeah, you can be, I mean, you can be angry at somebody and do something and that's, you feel guilty about it because that, that's, but um, shame is when I look at myself and say, you are, yeah, you're right. You're a bad, I'm a bad person. It's a, it's a, interning trauma. I, I traumatize myself by saying I'm a bad person. I'm acting against my values of honesty, faithfulness, kindness, you know, all these little little things that I, I'm a good parent, but I was something, and then I would act in a way that was, I would say things that were not really very well, kind of we're beating up on my kids to sense. Essentially, it's not, I wasn't physically beating up on my kids, but verbally, and that's what my dad did to me. And, I, and as soon as I would do that, I would feel the shame because that's what I knew what I felt like on the other side because I had I had felt that same trauma, right? Boy, it's tough when you feel that. It's, it's, it hurts to feel that. Um, without a program, I was flailing about trying to figure out how to solve, deal with that. I didn't really, I couldn't put my hand, I, I didn't know how to, I didn't I couldn't put my finger on what it was, but I knew I didn't feel good. I knew I had a big hole. I knew, and I was looking for solutions, like, you know, drinking would numb it. Drinking might facilitate other behavior that was not, that would just lead back to shame. But um, man, it took a lot of work to get out of that hole. I mean, um, and it, it, it could be current just reading as, okay, I am, you know, I am enough, that kind of stuff. You know, I have enough, I do enough, I am enough every day for like three years. And um, to remind myself that I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm okay with who I am. I wasn't 100% certain in the beginning, but I'm much better now. And I still get pangs of it because I, it's, you know, the memories come back, and I know I feel I know what it feels like. I know what it is, and so I can, um, and I do feel guilt about having done the behaviors that I've done, but I don't have that depth of feeling of negativity about who I am anymore. 
That's a miracle too. You know, I think those of us that come into the program later in life have so much more of the cringy, devastating history of bad behavior, you know, like we just had a lot more time out there to, to do that. And I can really relate. I just want to acknowledge you for your honesty and your vulnerability in sharing what you've shared. And I could feel it in my heart because I too am a mom and, you know, drank for, you know, all of my son's young life. I mean, he turned 18 just shortly after I got sober. So the pain of dealing with that behavior doesn't go away overnight, but the promises do tell us that we won't regret the past, nor will we wish to shut the door on it. And I feel like sometimes it doesn't, it should say, and we'll never feel cringy about it, but <laughs> it doesn't say that. And, um, you know, it becomes part of the equity that we have to share with people that come in mm -hmm. with the same kind of, I just feel honored to hear your story here tonight. So thanks for sharing that with us. And um, I can say too, that I feel a whole lot better about myself than I ever did when I came in. So it yeah, keeps getting better. Be common experience yeah so as we um start thinking about wrapping up what would you share because I, I hear you still you know a long time into recovery when you think about it like all these days have added up into some years and it's a long long time but still kind of probably feels new on some in some ways to you so um how, how what would you share with you know with a newcomer who might be feeling all that same pain and it's just so raw right now you know i think the best thing might be a hug actually um because it's hard to express all the pain and and, and sometimes that's what i've i think when i first came in i needed somewhere safe to be able to say how much i hurt inside and so that's kind of the message I'd like to give the newcomer. It's just, this is a safe place. If you're, if you're anything like me, I know you're hurting. So just let us know what you're feeling when you're ready. You know, and that's kind of what I might say. You know, I, I know from hearing it, you know, because I only have my own experience to relate, but that, you know, everybody has a different willingness to get started, right? And, and um, but that initial safety and the ability to be vulnerable um, and just say what it might express out the pain that was in my heart is valuable beyond measure. Bill, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us and sharing your experience, strength, and hope. It's been a wonderful conversation. Oh, this is uh, great. I feel great, too. It's always <laughs> nice to talk like this. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, and like you, Lee. Thank you for coming. Thanks to Bill for stopping by, and thanks to you, the listeners. If you want to find us online, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Reflection Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Daily Reflector. You can also read about recovery on our blog at blog.dailyreflectionpodcast.com. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.